a confidence in science means a little bit different sometimes than confidence used in other terms. So I wanted to put in the subtitle here. Is there an objective quantifiable way to test for a mind behind any effects such that genetic information tests positive within a range of probabilities? And so I stuck that range of probabilities in there uh, as a more, as basically what I'm thinking of when I talk about confidence. Is it more probable than not? Is it more likely than not? And um, now just one thing a bit about me for those of you who joined late is that I work uh, within a Christian ministry, but that ministry, I've been very fortunate that they see it as important that um, I still continue to be involved in, in philosophical and scientific research and publications. So I, I, I still have been able to continue on uh, to a limited degree in some of these projects. And what you're going to see here this morning is one of the small projects that's nearing completion and uh, ready for beginning to write up a paper on. So let's begin. Uh, <clears throat> there are a number of interesting problems that I think are relevant to this question. And the first, of course, is whether natural processes were involved in the origin and diversification of life. Is there, uh, and it's regardless of that. So when I speak publicly on a university campus somewhere on this issue, I, I, I like to start off by, by saying that regardless of whatever process, I'm prepared to grant whatever process you uh, prefer with regards to the origin of life and the diversification of life. But what I will argue is that regardless of the process, I will argue that there has to be a mind behind this process. So, but the question is, is there an objective way to test this, to test whether a mind was involved? And if so, where exactly was this mind involved? Is it involved? Is there particularly in, particular indicators or fingerprints that we can test for? There's another interesting problem, and that is how can we objectively quantify evolutionary changes? For example, I, I enjoy photographing butterflies, for example, and the red spotted purple and the white admiral butterflies were once thought to be two different species, but now we know they are not, in fact. They look quite different, but they're actually genetically uh, almost identical. And there's very little difference. And so how do you actually, when you look at, and this brings me to uh, taxonomy, is there a way to quantify the distance between different taxa? Um, if we were able to do that, we might see that actually for some areas, there's, n there's very little distance whatsoever. It's very easily that diversification is easily within the range of unguided natural processes, but there's other areas that might not be. And so this is another project that is relevant to this question. Number four, is there a way to objectively distinguish between justified and unjustified gaps? And uh, just to clarify what I mean by that, I, I essentially mean that um, some gaps are simply there because of a lack of information. And I would call those, um, um, well, they're justified in one sense, we simply do not have information, but they're not justified in the other sense that this is actually a real gap. Be, it may not be, we just simply don't have the information, but other gaps are, exist not on the basis of a lack of information, but on the, uh, their knowledge-based gaps. They're actually, as a result of what we have discovered and known, we see, oh, there's a problem here. And then specified complexity, is there a way to objectively quantify this? So the objectively quantifying is a very relevant to this question I'm addressing here. So just by way of preview, the first section will look at a scientific method to test for effects that required an intelligent programmer or a mind behind the process, regardless of whatever the process might have been. Uh, then I wanna look at two objections that have been raised in the science community against my method. And I wanna look at those. And then I wanna look at some support that has arisen from some other scientists using a different approach and uh, what they've discovered and how that complements what I've discovered and then finally the conclusion. So let's begin with the scientific method. And the main idea here is that the ability to produce a significant or non-trivial level of functional information is unique to intelligent minds. That's the main idea. Therefore, 
any effect that requires a significant level of functional information to produce will require an intelligent programmer. So that's the main idea. Now let's look at that in more detail. So let's begin with a hypothesis. And that is that the ability to produce a significant or non-trivial level of functional information is unique to intelligent minds. Key word there is unique. What I mean by that is that it, a mind is the only thing that will be able to produce significant levels of functional information. Now that's a hypothesis, but it is testable, it's verifiable or falsifiable. We can do that both in the lab and computationally. I just wanna look at uh, one, what I think is a key thing here with regard to testing, and I, I'm just trusting that the Q&A will, will expose whatever areas you want to delve in more deeply. So this is just a kind of an overview, but it has to do with the fitness function. Uh, I did graduate work in genetic algorithms and uh, it's a fascinating field and it's very powerful. You can, you can find solutions to problems that humans just simply on our own would never be able to. But the very first thing you have to do when you're presented with a problem that you want to write a genetic algorithm for is you have to figure out what is it that will uh, tell us whether we're getting closer to the solution or further away. So I took this quote from uh, one of the textbooks here uh, on genetic algorithms with regard to the fitness function. It's the, it represents the requirements to adapt to. It forms the basis for selection and thereby it facilitates improvements. More accurately, it defines what improvement means. From the problem solving perspective, it represents the task to solve in the evolutionary context. And so it was uh, very clear very early on, early on when you start getting involved in genetic algorithms that before you even start to code, to write any code at all, you need to figure out your fitness function. It requires careful thought. The more complex the problem, the more complex, the, the more uh, careful you will have to be. And so embedded within every successful genetic algorithm is a, uh, there's a mind behind the fitness function. You have to know some things ahead of time so that you can guide and direct the process or you can write the, cof the software that will do that. Now that has implications for an evolutionary search that um, is helpful. Now, how do we measure functional information? So in 2007, Hazen and colleagues published a paper and uh, they defined functional information as the difference I e to the X equals delta H. And by the way, for those of you that don't like equations, this will be, I think the only one we, we look at. Uh, delta H, well, the only fancy one. Delta H is actually the difference in Shannon uncertainty. Um, for those of you not familiar with Shannon uncertainty, just think about uncertainty. How uncertain are you at, when you start out um, before you've tried to solve the problem and how uncertain would you be if you had additional information and the change in uncertainty can be used as a measure of information. And that formula there you see is simply uh, a simplification of Shannon on the difference in Shannon uncertainty between two states, a functional state and a non-functional state. But what I want you to note here in this equation is that if you want for high information content, high information is inversely proportional to the probability. So that what that means is that the higher the information you have, the more improbable it becomes that it would occur just um, randomly or in, with an within an unguided search. EDX is simply the degree of the function to be satisfied. So uh, you can apply this anywhere outside of biology, but within biology, it's the cell that makes that decision, figuratively speaking. And MEX are the number of different configurations that achieve or exceed that. So there will be a certain number of configurations that actually satisfy that function out of a total of N possible configurations where all the remainder ones don't satisfy it. So M is the, I'll give you a very simple example in the next slide. But this ratio, M over N, represents the target size and sequence space. Some scientists call it the discoverability of a protein family. 
or it can also represent the probability of locating a functional sequence within a single search. So it's not just any probability, and that's often a mistake people make in these discussions, um, is that, well, look, it's uh, highly, I threw a deck of cards on the floor, that exact arrangement is highly improbable, therefore probability means nothing. Well, uh, that's not the kind of probability that's at the core of this information equation. The probability we're concerned with is, is the probability of a particular configuration being part of a subset that's functional or within the larger scope of things. So it's the probability of being functional, not the probability of simply existing in that configuration, which is relatively meaningless. So here's a very simple example applied to cracking a, the bank safe at the bank. <clears throat> So let's imagine that after this seminar, you feel uh, the need for some cash. You wander down to the local bank and you walk in there to break the, to crack the combination. And it has, you do some quick calculations and you realize this has about a hundred million possible combinations. So using that equation, the previous page, N would equal a hundred. That's the total number of possible combinations. But you are told, the rumor is on the street, that's only five that will actually open the vault. So M equals five. So you have five over 100. You put that ratio, plug those numbers into that equation in the previous page, and you realize you're going to need 24 bits of functional information in order to know any combination at all that will open that vault. And that's a very simple thing. Or you could say, I need some information to open this vault. Would somebody please write it on a piece of paper, the information I need? You can know in advance the quantity of information that will be handed you on that piece of paper once all the redundant uh, fluff has been filtered out. It'll be 24 bits. Now, uh, the problem with biological proteins is that we have two unknowns in one equation. For any protein family, we have no idea whatsoever of how many possible combinations or sequences are functional for a given protein family. And when I talk about a protein family, I'm just talking about all the proteins that, that share a similar overall structure. And for roughly 70% of biological proteins, they form three-dimensional globular structures. Another roughly 30% would be intrinsically unstructured. So um, this is the problem. We have no idea how many possible combinations are functional and we never will, assuming there's no divine revelations being given to that answer for a given protein. So the solution here is to transform, this is very important, transform the dimensionality of the problem by estimating delta H or the Shannon uncertainty of something different, not of the functional versus non-functional sequences, but of all the amino acid frequencies for each site between the ground state, which is where you start off with, and the functional state. So uh, what we're essentially doing is we're transforming the problem from sequence space to probability distribution space. And what we're going to see is those probability distributions stabilize very quickly and you could begin to predict those with even two or three sequences. And the more, of course, the better. And by the time you get to one or 2,000 sequences, the probability distribution is firmly established. So it's a much better space to be uh, considering when you're doing this calculation. And that was published in a paper in 2007 that I uh, published in, in the Journal of Theory of Biology and Medical Modeling. It's exactly the same starting as Hazen and uh, his colleagues did. Um, their paper was published the same year, but at the time I submitted my paper, I had no idea that theirs was being uh, considered as well. But the two are very complementary. They both start with delta H, but I've just transferred the dimensionality of the problem over to um, amino acid frequency at each site. And so uh, delta H equals the grounds, the uncertainty you have at the ground state and, and versus the functional state. Now note, the ground state is wherever you're starting. So it can be totally random, which is pretty rare in this world, or it can be determined by the physical system. For example, prebiotic evolution. Let's say you have a warm little pond somewhere, you're unlikely to have equal, uh, an equal distribution of all amino acids there whatever that distribution is, that will be your ground state. Or it could be set by the genetic code, which further skews things away from randomness. Or it could be a degrading protein, 
uh, where your ground state is actually a fully functional protein and you want to measure how much information you have lost uh, with the degrading of that, that uh, gene. So another important point is that function is, always, is defined in this case by the system. In this case, the system is the cell. So the cell does the filtering between those that work and those that do not. Uh, you always have to have some concept of a function before you can uh, calculate the functional information required to fulfill that function. You do not need to know the function. You just need to know that there is one. The cell tells you there is a function. If you see a, a protein family, uh, different sequence constantly emerging in your research, then you'll know that that's probably useful to the cell, that protein. It's encoded within the genome. It seems to be expressed in various ways throughout life, and therefore it's, it has a function. That's all you need to know. The next thing is, well, what is the information required for that function? Now, uh, this is just a minor objection. is isn't one of the two major ones, but a minor one, and I don't know if it's really an objection so much as a worry. And in a conversation with uh, Joshua Swamidas, he uh, stated that, uh, well, okay, my approach to functional information is idiosyncratic. Uh, I think by that he meant that it's um, kind of like a, it's Kirk's version. It's, it's uh, outlier, it's not mainstream. And he also insists that it's not how Zostak and Hazen defined it. Now, it simplifies to what they said here, but they do not, it is not arising out of a delta H. Now, I just want to say on the outset that it really doesn't matter whether something is, is, uh, is unique, if a scientist comes up with some unique approach that's not mainstream, what matters is, a, is it meaningful and does it work? Um, so my response actually is str even stronger than that. First of all, it is meaningful. It measures the difference in Shannon uncertainty between two states. And thus, because it measures the reduction in uncertainty, it is a meaningful measure of information because information is as intuitively tied to degrees of uncertainty. Information removes uncertainty. And so it's a very meaningful way to do it. Furthermore, I actually thought, well, I'll check with uh, Zostak and Hayes. And so I forwarded now, in their paper, they did not derive that equation. They just simply presented it. So I sent them an email uh, inquiring, uh, letting them know that um, in discussions of functional information, I wanted to make sure that I was accurately representing how they got that equation. So I, do, I put a short derivation there. It's very simple. It's only a few lines. It's not complicated. And I just wanted to know, am I accurately representing your derivation from delta H. And they both affirmed yes, definitely. I also included my paper and they were quite enthusiastic about my own work and, and we're staying in touch because they're very much interested in uh, some of the problems that I will address shortly. So it is not simply my version. It actually is identical to uh, their, the, the officially defined their version which means that the two papers, theirs and mine, are very complementary. And uh, yeah, so that's just dealing with a, a worry that's been raised. But I will say that I have found uh, Dr. Swamadas to be um, very insightful when it comes to pointing out possible problems. And I've appreciated uh, some of his input in this discussion. Uh, in, uh, in If anybody will find a problem uh, Joshua will be one of the people who is excellent to talk with. So uh, back to this question, what is a significant level of functional information? Given an extreme upper limit, this is always a problem in science. And if some of you have followed the p-value discussions and mistakes people make in calculating the p-value, you know that uh, significance is an issue. Um, so there's, it's not something that's carved in stone. There's not a, you know, a black and white 0 0.01 or whatever. Uh, it really has to be, you have to look carefully at the problem. So in this case, let's just take an extreme upper limit. Um, the total number of evolutionary events is 10 to the 43. That's an extreme upper limit. If you use a fast replication rate, a fast mutation rate, a large population of 10 to the 30th power, 
and uh, 4 billion years, you get something around 10 to the 42, which is my own calculation, and 10 to the 43, which is the one published by Dryden and colleagues. That would be extremely optimistic. They make that really clear. It's an extreme upper limit. In real life, there's a number of problems with everything going just perfectly. And in reality, it's probably closer to 18 bits rather than 143 bits. 18 bits, though, is living a little close to the edge, in my opinion. I like to be a little safer, so let's just double that to 36 bits. It should be a safe cutoff. Now, I am gambling a little bit here. I'm being a little bit daring by saying 36 bits. I would like to, if I really wanted to sleep well at night, I could raise it to 50, knowing full confidence no, nothing will ever be found that will falsify that. But Let's uh, not be unrealistically conservative here, so I'll go with 36. Now, a thing to remember is I've doubled it from 18 to 36, but uh, remember that 36 bits is, is twice as many bits as 18, but it is not twice as hard to obtain 18 bits, um, to obtain 36 bits. It's actually approximately 1 million times harder because of the logarithmic nature of information, the definition of information as you saw in that equation one back there. So that's something to remember. So as we increase, as we get above that threshold, that cutoff, which will be important, uh, we should not just say, oh, this is only four times as hard. No, it becomes many orders of magnitude harder. So here's the method. Estimate the functional information required to code for a given protein family using a large multiple sequence alignment from the protein family database. And number two, if that result is greater than the cutoff of 36 bits, then according to the hypothesis I laid out earlier, according to that hypothesis, then the protein family that you're examining tests positive for a mind behind the encoding. Now this method will work outside the field of biology. It works right across the board for forensic science, SETI, archeology, span um, and so forth. But our application here for this seminar is just proteins. So it's really founded on that hypothesis. That's the important thing to remember. So, so to falsify this method, uh, one must falsify that hypothesis. So uh, just for an example, RECA, it's a universal protein. I downloaded a, a multiple sequence alignment, and from this point on, I'll just try and call it MSA for, uh, to, for brevity's sake. I downloaded an MSA containing a lot of sequences. I filtered out all the redundant ones, and I was left with over 8,500 unique sequences for RecA, uh, which, uh, just as an aside, is a minuscule, probably a minuscule fraction of the total number of sequences that will actually code for this structure and be functional. Uh, running it through the program using that method that I published in 2007, it turns out you need about 788 bits of functional information to encode RecA in the genome. That's just for the protein. The actual genes will often carry more information because they might have to carry information to do with activation and so forth. So if you actually now, once you have that information using the method that I've proposed, you can then solve for the target size and sequence space, and it turns out to be 10 to the minus 237th power. That's the target size. That's the portion of uh, sequence space for that many amino acids that, is, um, that will be functional for Rec A. And when I look at these MSAs, I reduce the sequence to the shortest length that biology seems to permit uh, just to filter out all the um, insertions and so forth to reduce the information as much as possible. Now, the probability that a mind can generate 788 bits of functional information is one. That's a posteriori probability. We do that all the time. It's empirically demonstrable, verifiable. When you write a one-page essay, for example, you've exceeded that already. So we know that minds can generate that degree of information, but the probability that an unguided natural process could is what you see right there. It's astonishingly small. And note that I, I, I say unguided here, because if a natural process is guided, then all bets are off. I would expect you can accomplish almost anything you wish. Conclusion, observationally, that is using real life data, 
An intelligent programmer is much more likely than natural processes to have encoded the gene, vastly more likely. And therefore, I would say that we can be very confident that a mind was behind the encoding of REC A uh, at some point in the past when REC A was first encoded into some genome. Now, why is a random walk or unguided evolution a non-option to provide, produce significant information? Well, what the data shows is that the, si the target size in sequence space, let's th think of an island like this um, mountain you see too on the picture here, think of an island where uh, it sticks out of the ocean and then there's this, this ocean extending in every direction. And the ocean is non-folding, non-functional sequence space for globular proteins. Uh, that's the ocean. And the island represents the functional sequence space for that protein. That means it, the top of that island represents all the different sequences that could possibly code for a functional REC A protein. And when the, what the data shows is that this is not a hill climbing problem. That is, you just can't start anywhere. In a genetic algorithm, just as an aside here, you will first of all generate a, a pile of a bunch of or a set of possible solutions. And all of those solutions have a certain degree of viability, otherwise you can't even get your genetic algorithm started. So you just assume they have a certain fitness uh, degree and you assume that the solution to the problem is a hill climbing problem so that the fitness function or the selection process slowly drives the possible solutions up the slope to a global, hopefully a global maximum. But given, but for a needle haystack problem, that's very different. There's no slope that extends out far beyond. And I would just ask you in the picture to ignore that lower slope. There may be a very slope, uh, small slopes around the edge of, of functional sequence space. They're still semi-functional, but once you venture out too far, you fall off the edge here. And that edge would represent a very steep fitness uh, factor and a very steep or fitness gradient. And so whenever you have a very steep fitness gradient, then um, natural processes can, and natural selection can drive the sequence back up onto the island. So natural selection has the effect of preserving functional sequences because of the needle in the haystack situation. It'll drive them back up onto the island provided they're not too far away. Just to give you a perspective on how rare these areas of folding functional sequence space are, and this is based on real data here. If an average uh, ratio is 10 to the minus 150th power, which is quite conservative, but I'll be conservative here for, so as not to overstate uh, my point, then if M represents an island one square meter in the ocean of non-folding sequence space, then the average distance between the islands of functional solution space would be about 7,000 light years. This is, um, this is actually based on many different protein families I've looked at, <clears throat> that it's mostly, most amino acid combinations will not give you a stable folding structure. The question is how rare are these? And this gives you, begin to give you an idea. So natural selection will not work in between the islands where there simply is no function. It will work close to the islands to drive sequences back up there, but it will not be of any help to, to discover novel protein families. In that case, uh, some work by Blanco a number of years ago uh, demonstrated that it'll have to be accomplished via a random walk. And a random walk over 7,000 light years to find something one square meter well, then you run into time constraints, given that the universe you know, will only last so long for the last star burn. So now I wanna look at part two here, two objections. Two objections that have been raised by other scientists against this. And the first one, uh, this has been raised by a few different scientists I've uh, dialogued with on this one, including Joshua Swamidas, but others had raised it prior to that. And that is, well, our data are an inadequate sampling of functional sequence space. The assumption here is that evolution somehow finds, I'm talk, when I say evolution, I'm just talking about unguided evolution. That's to be clearly distinguished, say, from a, a guided evolution. But unguided evolution finds a novel functional protein. And then the sequence, the functional sequence 
its samples slowly spreads out via common descent, like a drop of dye in the ocean. At first, it's highly localized and only slowly spreads out. And so the area that that dye has covered may not be anywhere remotely close to the total area of functional sequence space for that given protein. So if we were actually using Hazen's, trying to, using Hazen's equation, and for M, we were just simply using the value or the number of known functional sequences that we've observed in, bio, in biological life, then absolutely that would be correct. Totally it would be correct. It would be obviously a, uh, not just a poor method, it would be of no help whatsoever in estimating the amount of information required to code for a protein family if we were doing it on the basis of discovered sequences. And this is the reason why you go back to that 7,000 light years on average between the things, even the island itself of one square meter, we may have only uh, examined one square nanometer of that island. And so the island might be actually much larger than the few sequences we've discovered. So uh, example for Rec A there, you can actually go back and solve for M and it turns out that there's an estimated 10 to the 105th power of possible functional sequences for Rec A and out of that massive, enormous number of possible functional sequences, all we have discovered thus far is just over 8,500. Uh, and that was at the time uh, when I downloaded that MSA. That's always being added to as we learn more sequences. But we can transform the dimensionality of the problem into indirectly property-based sequences. So what I mean by that is that a given protein family usually tolerates only a subset of amino acids at each location in the sequence on the basis of their properties and function. So we, we, we admit that sequence space is far too large to sample and to get an accurate idea of directly, but we transform it into amino acid property space, which is very small. And it's rapidly established within only a few sequences. So this results in a frequency distribution of amino acids along the sequence that's unique to each protein family determined mainly by, in the case of globular proteins, the 3D structure. And that 3D structure is predetermined by physics. In the same way that bank vault, the combinations that worked had already been determined before you walked into the bank to try and crack the safe. So what biology has to do is it has to discover these islands out there somehow. And uh, what we're trying to do as scientists is try and figure out how big the islands are. So we have to do that, we have to transform the dimensionality of the problem. But this greatly simplifies the, the search space when you start not, no longer concentrating on the search space of sequences, but the search space of frequency distributions based on amino acid properties. In fact, with just a single sequence, you, be, you can begin to predict what that amino acid distribution, probability distribution will be. For example, if you see a um, hydrophobic amino acid at site number 23, you could predict with maybe a low degree of certainty at this point, because you're only looking at one sequence, but you could predict that this will tolerate several amino acids, but they will be hydrophobic. And you're doing that on the basis of only one sequence. Of course, if you get one or 2,000 sequences, then it becomes very, the, uh, it's stabilized. There's no longer really any doubt as to what the distribution will be. And any further sampling you do in, in sequence space will always fall within that probability distribution space. So here's an example. How do you know that you have adequately sampled your, your samples large enough to, have, to get a, arrive at a stable ratio of M over N when it comes to not sequences, but the probability distributions of each amino acid at each site in the sequence? Well, it, it, it levels off into a horizontal asymptote. So in this case, for this particular protein domain, which happens to be a universal protein domain, you need just over 600 bits of functional information to code for that one domain. And now if your sample was, and that by 2000 unique sequences, you you pretty much, this frequency distribution is stable. You add further amino acids, further sequences, you're not gonna change anything because physics has already determined that to 
code for that particular structure. You're going to need these properties and that determines what amino acids will be at each site. And any further explanation just simply confirms over and over and over again, it falls into that distribution. I want to point one thing out though. Imagine uh, that you're only looking at one sequence. If you assume there's only one sequence that, fo that codes for a given protein family, then in this case, you would require 1500 bits of functional information, but that would be completely and totally misleading. That would be a mistake because we know that a lot more than just one codes and you can see the effect of adding sequences uh, to your uh, sampling in an effort to f figure out what the probability distributions are of the, all the different amino acid sequences at each site. And you can see that for at first there's a rapid drop because your initial predictions, while well, there's a lot of room for there's a lot of leeway for guessing there, but as time goes on, the guessing is over, the data has come in and this is where it levels off. So when people ask me, how do you know you've got a large enough sample size that evolution has provided us with enough samples? This is one thing I will show them. Now at this point, I wanna look, raise um, an objection um, raised by Matlock and Swamidas. They, they have done the best job of raising this objection. Other scientists merely just said, well, your sampling will be constrained by common descent. But here they actually wrote a simulation that demonstrated that there's something, that my method of finding a horizontal asymptote does not work. And here's the results of their simulation. They uh, randomly generated sequences for an imaginary non-functional protein. And we already know from that equation that the information required to code for a non-functional protein is zero. You don't need any information at all. Any combination of amino acids will work. So if my method is correct, the horizontal the asymptote should level off at a value approaching zero. But what he demonstrated is it does not, but there's a very important uh, caveat here. You can see on that plot, uh, let's just look at the bottom one. If you limit your sampling to just one mutational event per amino acid or one mutational event per site, and you keep increasing your sampling, but always limit it within that constraint, you will find that the horizontal asymptote levels off at over 100 bits of inf functional information. And therefore, he concludes that he has falsified this approach that I use to see if my sampling is adequate. Now, all of us knew, and Swamidas, Matlock, myself, knew that it should level off at zero. So when you see your simulation failing to do that, then you have to ask why. And the reason is, is actually right there looking at you in the graph. So um, <clears throat> here, what we're... Basically, the problem is, is that inadvertently he introduced a constraint, a sampling constraint. He was constraining all the samplings, in this case that I've circled here, to just an average of a half an event per amino acid or one. Now, that is a constraint. You see, the reason that you'll reach a horizontal asymptote is that the frequency distribution is constrained somehow. In biology, it's constrained by function. In this simulation, it's not constrained by function because there is none. It's constrained by the sampling that was imposed on the system. And uh, so the question is, well, does this occur in real life? If you had, let's say, evolution hasn't sampled enough sequences yet to give you your uh, your results and the answer to that is no. First of all, when I use an MSA, I filter out all the redundant ones. So I'm only using unique ones. But in biology, as mutations occur, so does the mutational events per amino acid. And if it is inadequate to have stabilized yet, you will see what we saw on the previous curve that I sh showed you where you're seeing um, it has it will not stabilize to a horizontal asymptote. It'll always be dropping lower and lower as you add more samples to your system, provided you are not yourself adding constraints. So let's say if there's a, a relatively recent protein that has appeared recently, um, you will probably not have enough samples yet to adequately estimate the amount of functional information required to code for that. But that will show up as a curve that fails to uh, level off at zero. You will see it's still curving downwards. There's still 
sloping downwards as you add more samples. And so you can easily do that uh, in a diagram I'm about to show you. But the data here shows, and Swamadas and Matlock both agree that if you have sufficient numbers of a mutational events per amino acid, then it will converge to zero and the method will work. So the question is, in, in real life, in biology, how many mutational events has occurred per site? And it's very obvious from looking at the MSAs for at least universal proteins where I've been focusing, is that there has been an absolute minimum of 20 events per site. That is, we've had enough time, or there has been enough time to sample all 20 amino acids at every single site for all the universal proteins. And so if that is the case, and I'm using uh, then uh, Swamadas's objection is satisfied, we're not constraining our sampling to just one mutational event per. In fact, when I look at the MSAs for real life proteins, there is not a single case where you see only an average of one amino acid per site. They, to my knowledge, they don't exist. Now that does raise a, dis I was somewhat disturbed by looking at a lot of these MSAs because to me they appear that there may, instead of just one ancestral protein appearing for a given protein family and then all of them diverging from that, I suspect there may have been uh, uh, quite a few ancestral proteins all appearing simultaneously at, in different areas of sequence space to account for that degree of sampling because it does appear to be quite spread out over sequence space. That's just, I had not expected that actually, but um, I've not tested it either. And I think the way to test that is to look for genes that are unique for higher life forms, like say for mammals, look for genes that are unique to mammals and, and do the uh, process that I'm about to show you for those and see if it levels off or not and just see how well the sampling has been. And if it's been totally fine for mammals, then, um, then maybe that concern is added. So just to be on the safe side, here's what I would recommend if you want to protect yourself from um, inadvertently having too small of a sample size or an inadequate sampling of sequence space due to common descent. This here is done for a particular uh, universal protein again. And you will note that when the sample size was small, the curve was dropping very rapidly. And the blue curve represents the number of mutational events per site measured in terms of how many different amino acids seem to be tolerated at that site. And it leveled off at 18. So this particular universal protein tolerates an average of 18 amino acids per site. And in fact, I was very surprised to see that for all of these proteins, I typically thought it would be three or four per site on average. No, it's typically 16, 17, or 18 amino acids per site, but not all of these amino acids are equally tolerated per site, depending on the properties and so forth. And there's an additional problem of error, erroneous sequences being included in the protein family database. As I understand it, it's sorted by a hidden Markov method, and that's not 100% error-free. So even if you get a single erroneous sequence, into that protein family, you will, you may well see a single amino acid that only occurs once in that entire MSA, but this method will uh, still, sh it'll still show up as one of the amino acids tolerated at that site. Uh, there's a lot more that could be said by this, but basically what we see is that by the time you get 2000 different sequences happening, and by the time you get maybe 15 different amino acids on average, in other, in other words, if your sample demonstrates that it has a sufficient number of mutational events per site, you can be confident that you are now going to get a good estimate. In other words, uh, your horizontal asymptote, it's gonna actually level off where it should be and uh, I think Matlock and Swamadas would have to, at least they seem to agree that the more mutational events, the better my method would work. And they only did it up to one. This real life suggests a minimum of 20, but that's assuming every mutation introduced a completely new amino acid. And you never actually resampled other ones. When you actually do that, it goes up enormously. There's been many more than just 20 amino acids per site. It's more likely to be in the millions of mutational events per site. 
I won't spend a lot of time on this, but this is just a portion of some of the protein families I've looked at. I want to look, draw your attention to the green column here. That gives you the average number of amino acids per site, just to demonstrate that there is a lot of mutational events occurring here, enough such that we can be confident that we're going to get the horizontal asymptote leveling off where it should be. And then I want to draw your attention to that magenta column, which is the amount of information required to code for these different universal proteins. And you see that it's enormous for every one of those. They're way above the threshold of 36 bits. And recall, according to the hypothesis, if you get a significant level, if you have an effect requiring significant level of functional information, then that requires a mind. There has to be a mind behind that encoding. In this case, we're worried about the encoding of the protein coding genes. And, in, and what we're seeing is that the numbers are way, way higher than this cutoff threshold. So, um, and it's not just one protein family we need for the last universal common ancestor. We're going to need, you know, 250, 300 different protein families. And so <clears throat> the effect is cumulative. The amount of information you're going to need for the first life form is, is mind staggering. And if you look at the probability column there, you will see these probabilities are so vanishingly small. It would not be, and, and, and keeping in mind, it's a needle in the haystack problem, not a hill climbing problem that I think we can be very confident there's a mind behind this process. So practical application back to the objection, choose protein families that have at least 2000 unique sequences. And I like, I, I just work with proteins that seem to have a wide occurrence across the taxonomy of life. Universal proteins being the best ones, of course. And the reasoning behind that is that these different taxa are what you could say are evolving independently of all of each other. So they're all working in different areas of sequence space, but they all converge on the same values of the probability distribution space. They all converge on that. And then if any, if there's any further doubt, check the amino acid versus functional information curve that I showed you earlier. The second objection here, uh, all, this one was raised only by Matlock and Somadas, and they actually made a simulation to demonstrate that. And that is that uh, natural selection actually will drive the, uh, the, um, the sampling towards a global maximum, the most efficient sequences for that particular protein family. And with the assumption here is that the fitness of a protein is like a hill within it with a single global maximum natural selection selects the sequences that are close to the top of the hill when in fact there may be many times more sequences that are still functional but lower down the hill and don't show up in our sampling in in real life sampling and it's i'm not talking about our sampling i'm talking about what biological life has sampled through a protest process of mutation and insertions and deletions and so forth so what do we say to that? Well, uh, there's actually quite a bit to say, and I had to cut out most of it because <laughs> the talk had to remain within um, some sane amount of time. Number one, science does not support the idea that natural selection always occurs on the level of individual proteins. Sometimes it will, of course, if it has to do with the, with the thing even surviving or being able to replicate. But for many proteins, it's more on the natural selection works on the level of the whole organism within the environment. It's not selecting on the basis of individual proteins. And secondly, we often observe examples in real life of particular proteins that are not particularly fit. Uh, transthyretin is one that I've looked at where it's often will misfold, which suggests that it's right on the edge of functional sequence space, but yet it still continues to hang in there in our genomes. Um, however, all this aside, the problem is, is set aside. The ad objection is answered by transforming the problem to a property-based probability distribution, amino acid frequencies, which are based on properties. We have also transformed the role of natural selection, which weeds out amino acids that do not fit the immediate stable frequency distribution as dictated by the properties required as you move down that sequence. So in other words, to satisfy the function, and if it's a globular protein, that three-dimensional structure, there's certain properties that need to be there. And natural selection just makes sure they fit within that property. So that frequency distribution. And the frequency distributions can be estimated very early with very small sample sizes, but they really stabilize down the road. So um, natural selection does not seem to be 
work uh, it seemed to be a concern here. However, to be on the safe side, I didn't go through this area of my chart, but I, I also have my program calculate an absolute lower minimum. So for example, that protein that tolerates uh, on average 18 amino acids per site, I say, what if we assume that it actually does tolerate 18 amino acids every single site? You know, in real life, you'll see some sites are highly conserved, others are not. But let's assume that all of them have an average of 18. What would the information be? You crunch the numbers and it still turns out that many, not all, but many of the, well, probably most of the universal proteins still are above that threshold. And secondly, uh, those that aren't are usually just structural domains and then they're very close to it. But I have to say that no one, I don't think, would argue that the average protein tolerates between 16 to 18 amino acids at each site down that protein. There are always conserved areas. And so my point is, is that is an extreme lower limit for for information that everybody ought to agree with and nobody would dispute. And even then, since we're going to need a large number of these different protein families, again, the information adds up, the probabilities add up, and we are way beyond the threshold beyond which a mind has to be. Um, the also, our observations of protein structure seems to indicate that they do not support this hill climbing uh, problem in forming proteins and uh, maximizing their fitness. It seems to be represented, as I said earlier, more like a mesa, where you'll see a, a topography maybe at the top. Some are slightly better than others, but the sides are quite drop off quite steeply, and then they're non-functional. Uh, now, there has been some verification or support from an entirely different approach, and uh, recently Tian and Best published a paper where they estimated basically the ratio of M over N. They didn't call it that. They call it um, uh, something we'll see shortly, but their approach was to use a, was to use a statistical model based on residue to residue coevolution. So what they were looking at is pairwise relationships within the multiple sequence alignment, and that is definitely will give you a more accurate estimate of that ratio. Um, I do not. I, pairwise relationships are indirectly will affect your frequency distribution. But uh, I can demonstrate that it will still result, my method still results in underestimating the amount of functional information required on average per site. Underestimating this, their method will be a little closer. Now, the results were that SC asterisk, which they refer to, they describe as a protein's discoverability, but translating that into Hazen's language, it's simply M over N. They describe it as extremely small and they published their results for a number of different proteins here. And their results are in the black column. So I uh, wrote to them and asked if I could, uh, they would mind sharing their data with me, that is their MSAs with me that they use. I'd like to run them through my approach just to see how that works out. And my, my results are in blue. And you can see that in each case, my results are more conservative than theirs. But when I am arguing for a mind behind life, I'd much rather be on the conservative side rather than the optim. Well, I, I don't think the results are optimistic. I think the results are actually more accurate than mine. Uh, but I prefer to remain on the conservative side. So you see what their results show is that a, far from overestimating the amount of functional information required to code for a protein, their approach actually, my approach is actually underestimating that. And I actually mentioned that I think in my initial paper that the assumption that I made would result in an underestimate. So conclusions, biological life provides us with sufficient data for many protein families to give reasonable estimates of the functional information required to code for a given protein family. It does, provided we're looking at the frequency distribution of amino acids, which is a property-based approach rather than, than trying to find all the sequences. Number two, for all protein families and domains tested to date, the functional information required ranges, and this is conservatively, between 57 bits and 871 bits. There may be proteins that are even more amazing that require more information. I just haven't come across. These are just the ones that I have run through um, my, my program. Number three, we can conclude, therefore, that the functional information required to code for biological proteins uh, 
required an intelligent programmer. In other words, there had to be a mind behind the encoding. And that mind had to have the ability to know all, know the effects of all the amino acids at each site and their fine psi angles on the overall structure and function of the physical chemical laws involved in, in those things uh, for an interacting assembly to, in order to properly code. Um, and that's something well beyond our own computational ability, although we can certainly see properties down the sequence. And that's a start on making artificial proteins, and we've actually been able to m start making uh, some simple artificial proteins uh, by looking, by kind of looking at these properties. To summarize, I would say using, uh, applying the hypothesis I presented at the beginning, that functional information is unique to, to, uh, to minds, that is, non-trivial levels, we look at the information encoded in genetics and come to the conclusion that it tests positive for a mind behind the process, whatever that process was.